Are we ready? Yes, sir. Because it's starting whether you wanted to or not. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> it was a beautiful autumn 39 years ago, and I lived and worked in Vermont. Weeks before, we said goodbye to our friends from Summerstock Company, and uh, we stayed on, two of us, my friend Ellen and I, were hired to spend the autumn in southern Vermont doing eight shows a week of a, a show called I Do, I Do. You heard of I Do, I Do? It was a, play, a playhouse in um, Mount Snow. Uh, can you imagine getting paid to live in, the, in Vermont in the autumn? It was just uh, unbelievable. The show was put together as entertainment for uh, one of the Leaf Peeper tours, as they were called, Leaf Peepers. Uh, mostly seniors in busloads would come to Vermont to see the foliage, to have dinner, and then to see a show. And then we would be told when we arrived at the theater what kind of evening to expect. A six bus show, that was really high cotton. That was gonna be pretty full. And then it went down slowly to a one bus load show. And that was uh, basically a clump of people who uh, usually sat together as if they were still on the bus. <laughs> and it went downhill from there. It was a musical about two people named Michael and Agnes, beginning with their wedding day and ending with their moving on 50 years later, aging with uh, makeup and costume changes along the way. And the producers of the Green Mountain Guild, by whom we were employed, moved the cast and crew up to a more out of the way ski chalet. Uh, and it had a deck, I remember, that just jutted out over this rushing creek. And they gave us this older VW micro bus in which to get to town. I never wanted to come back. It was perfect. Our walk to the theater was longer now, and every day it brought me to two roads that diverged in a yellow wood. It's Vermont, it happens. And you might say the poem by Robert Frost is American scripture. It is known and revered by more people than perhaps any other poet's work, I think. Though Frost himself, as a man, well, I'll say he was buried in the uh, graveyard of one of our churches up in Bennington while his family is pointedly buried at the other end of the cemetery. <laughs> Troublesome man. So I'd like to know, how much of an influence has that poem had on you? You know the poem? Did you ever memorize the poem? It goes, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, and then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept that first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I chose the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The road to the left was the road to work. It was where the small restaurants and bars that served the motels and ski chalets were for tourists. The one to the right was for exploring during the day, for bending down and drinking cold water directly from a stream, for talking to the occasional hiker who came along, for the philosophical discussions with Barb, our stage manager, who actually had a tattoo on the back of her neck, it was a sunburst, and it was a wonder to behold a woman with a tattoo in 1978. <laughs> Every day I stopped to look at the two roads that diverged in a yellow wood, 
And it made me want to say the poem over and over, silently or otherwise, and that's how I memorized it, because of course, we've all made our own choices. We've all taken our paths. We all know this is where we're going. What if, what if, what if? And now came a certain evening when Ellen and I were getting ready to become Michael and Agnes Snow from youth to old age, and the stage manager walked back to the dressing room to tell us this. We are a no-bus evening. No buses are coming. There was rarely any foot traffic, just package deals. So this might be our first night off, but we had to stay until 8 o'clock. And then, at 7.50, who knows what, a shy-looking young couple wandered in shortly after we got the news. They were Vermont dressed up. Vermont dressed up means that you can tell that they were trying to make an effort to call this a special, but not a showy occasion, while being sensible about it. That's Vermont. They looked a little wary of the empty theater, and Barb, the stage manager, told them the story. She said, we will absolutely put the show on for you at 8 o'clock, but you may be the only two people in a theater that seats about 400. Would that make you uncomfortable? The couple asked to confer for a moment, and we were on tenterhooks. Were we on? Were we off? And then we got the news. They were here on their honeymoon in Brattleboro. Brattleboro. There are some bright lights, city goings on there. Population 43,000. They were married yesterday. They don't have anywhere else to go. So if we really, really, really didn't mind, they would like to see our show. They sat in the center of an empty theater. And at some point, the awkwardness wore off, and they started to laugh, and they started to applaud, maybe even going overboard, as I dimly remember this, to cheerlead and make us feel good. And we, in turn, I remember distinctly, just decided to have fun that night. And I can't say who went out and did it, but in the end, I do remember that Ellen and uh, the, the both of us came out at the curtain call with a fancy little cake and a bottle of something fizzy. We invited them to come backstage for wedding cake and toast, something, and they came back and we talked. We talked for a while, such different people enjoying each other's company so thoroughly, and my hope is that next year, whoever they are and wherever they are now, they will celebrate 40 years together, and I hope that they tell, and have been, in fact, telling the story about getting married and going to see a show about a wedding and what comes next put on by a theater that did it just for them. The parable that Jesus is telling today is one about the king inviting the guests to the wedding. The first set of guests simply don't show up. It wasn't even a one-bus night for them. They simply drifted away. The second set of guests go a little further. They return the invitation by killing the king's messengers, and they are found and killed in return. And finally, the guests, any and all who would come, find their way to the banquet. But there is one. There's one guest who came unprepared or unwilling to dress for the occasion, the wedding of the king's son, what some commentaries take great pains to explain as the celebration of the Son of Man and the church. We are missing the bus. We are missing the bus today. Our mainline churches are growing smaller and they have experienced becoming a less significant voice in the moral debate of our day. While televangelists get airtime because they are crazy and the dominant Christian voices get pressed because they are mean. And in the midst of all of this, we went outside today. We grabbed shovels and hard hats 
and decided that despite the evidence, we're going to build us one great building because we're not going to stay out of the moral debates of today. And I think that's what needs to be done. A Lutheran scholar, Dr. Raquel St. Clair Letsom, says, somewhere along the line, we have to let go, we have let go, rather, of what is central to Christianity, which is life and liberty and love. And we have latched on to an idolatrous Christianity that has as its golden calf a hypocritical mix of Second Amendment rights, religious freedom that isn't free unless it can prove that it can step on the rights of other people of whom it disapproves, and bought loyalties. And indeed, it is not enough anymore to call yourself a follower of Jesus and then act as if you were, uh, had somehow fallen asleep during the Sermon on the Mount. It is not enough to pledge allegiance to church membership without then vowing to live out that chosenness that you feel in the world. It's not enough to say you are a Christian and then stay silent when life and liberty and love, no matter who it is, is in jeopardy. The wedding robe that the man forgot to bring that caused him to be thrown out was his commitment to be a part of a compassionate Christian witness that looked after some and looked after all. And Lutheran professor Caroline Lewis compares the incorrectly dressed man did the wedding to something out of an episode of what not to wear. Okay, so some people have been asking me, well, let's do some more clips, let's do some more clips. So I looked up what not to wear and thought of showing a clip today. It's an awful program. <laughs> have you seen it? She says, Many are called, but few are chosen indeed. The chosen are the ones who realize that just showing up is not enough anymore. The chosen are the ones who insist that mere acquiescence week after week, day after day, to doctrine and dogma will not stand the test of what it means for us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth, Jesus tells us. We are the light of the world. And the chosen are the ones who understand that the time for bringing about the kingdom of heaven is now. It's not later, it's not tomorrow, it's not someday, but it's now, and now, and now, and always now again. And maybe Matthew's issue is not so much that the wedding guest showed up dressed like an episode of what not to wear, but that he was unaware of the urgency of the invitation. He did not realize he was not informed of the fact that a summons to this great banquet here, God's banquet, we might say, means an immediate call to action. And we've been so preoccupied how to get people in the pews that we've set aside for far too long any kind of proclamation that communicates exigency. What not to wear? Complacency, conformity, any kind of garb that is content with the way things are now. What should we wear so that the whole of the world can see who we are and what we are about? That would be the kind of compassion that cannot anymore leave things simply the way they are. And so if you're here today, you're in. We have been on a different journey together for many years now. We mean to show a kinder and more loving side of how we believe Jesus wants us to follow him. Ours has been a different path, and that has proven to be positive. We took the path less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Dreams have been put into words, and words have been put into plans, and today's plans have been put into action. Amen. <laughs>